All right, we're going to look at three of Herbert's uh, poems today, all of them uh, theologically related in some ways, um, connected in ways that is not obvious at first glance. The three poems that we're looking at are his poem, Aaron, uh, his poem, Windows, or as it was originally entitled, Church Windows, and his third, which is Redemption. Um, as far as this first poem goes, let me put it up on the screen here for you. Aaron. Uh, Aaron is, of course, the brother of Moses and uh, was uh, part of the uh, priesthood. And Aaron's son's part of the Levitical priesthood, part of the Levites. Uh, who were one of the tribes of Israel and uh, were uh, priests by vocation uh, as a uh, tribe. But Aaron is part of that priesthood, and he was to wear certain regalia as a consequence of that, including um, a headdress, uh, uh, something on his breastplate, the umim and thumim, um, with uh, 12 stones on it, representing the 12 tribes of Israel, uh, with bells, uh, sort of with a, a surplus of some sort on, uh, which, which had at, below that pomegranates uh, and, and bells ringing and so forth. Um, this is all necessary to know because <coughs> it's the uh, garments <coughs> or the vestments that Aaron is wearing that Herbert plays upon here and its manifold significance as well. All of the uh, vestments that the Aaronic priesthood <coughs> will wear um, have a significance for Herbert. Now, this is not without any consequence in terms of the Reformation. I mentioned already in the discussion of Reformation theology or the differences between the reformers and the Catholic Church. One of them was in the area of church vestments, and I also said that even amongst the reformers, there were there were uh, distinctions and differences uh, between them in this regard, uh, going all the way from those who more or less would wear the vestments uh, that you would see were common in the Catholic Church to those that would dress more or less without any vestments per se and regard the vestments as a distraction. Uh, Herbert would have been inclined towards the former in terms of vestments, uh, if anything could be dis uh, discerned from this poem. But even if we were not to see it that way, and I don't think we need to see it that way, because uh, what Herbert is emphasizing in this poem is exactly the significance of the vestments, theologically speaking. It's not a matter of uh, the clothing per se, but what the clothing signifies. And it's the matter of the signification that is, at, is being emphasized in the poem. So let me read it first of all. And what I want you to note from the outset is the <coughs> fact that it's five stanzas of five lines, all of which has uh, a very similar theme and there, yet there's a progression of this throughout the entirety of the poem. But each line of each successive stanza, or at least each word at the end of each line of each successive stanza is the exact mirror image of that which comes before it. So you'll note that the first stanza begins with head, then breast, then dead, then rest, then dressed. Likewise, the second head, breast, dead, rest, dressed, etc. And that will, will be consistent throughout all five stanzas. And so there's a remarkable um, and strong structure to the poem. And yet within that uh, parallelism, and there clearly is parallelism and repetition, there's also extraordinary variation. And so this poem, which is in many ways on the artfulness and the signification of the artfulness of the dress of the Aaronic priesthood is emphasizing above all uh, something that is different or varies from the apparent similarity between the lines of the stanza. And 
that variance, the, the differentiation that is taking place is in the signification of the signs. So you could just see the signs and see them as uh, signs without signification. You could see there are no importance, no significance whatsoever. In a sense, Herbert might even agree with you on that front. And he certainly would agree if you, if you, under, you don't understand the vestments, the, the surplus, the clerical uh, uh, regalia without signification. He thinks the signification is extremely important. So let me read the poem. Holiness on the head, light and perfections on the breast, harmonious bells below, raising the dead to lead them unto life and rest. Thus are true errands dressed. Profaneness in my head, defects and darkness in my breast, a noise of passions ringing me for dead unto a place where is no rest. Poor priest, thus am I dressed. Only another head I have, another heart and breast, another music making live, not dead, without whom I could have no rest. In him I am well dressed. Christ is my only head, my alone only heart and breast, my only music striking me even dead, that to the old man I may rest and be in him new dressed. So holy in my head, perfect and light in my dear breast, my doctrine tuned by Christ, who is not dead, but lives in me while I do rest. Come, people, Aaron's dressed. Okay, so there are two things that he's doing in this poem that it seems to me that deserve our attention, in addition to the parallelism and the uh, progress that we see uh, in spite of the parallelism and apparent uh, lack of movement in the poem. The first is that he appeals to two uh, individuals, at least two. One, he is appealing to Aaron, but he's also appealing to those who fall in the line of Aaron, and that is the priesthood. Not now the Levitical priesthood, but rather those who carry on the ministry of the priesthood, and in his uh, case, uh, himself as a priest, as a uh, one who bears the uh, holiness of God and has the, um, uh, the duties and the vocation to preach the gospel to others. Um, <clears throat> I won't get into the debate over... Uh, the nature of the ministry and so forth, although that's probably prompted by the poem, but then we would get down into uh, thick weeds entirely here, and I don't really want to uh, point that out here, but he's talking first about the original priesthood, the, the, the Levitical priesthood that Aaron becomes a part of, and then the new priesthood, uh, but the new priesthood is a, a better priesthood than the first. And the new priesthood is represented not by Aaron, but by Jesus Christ. He is our great high priest, it says in the book of Hebrews. It's no longer the Levitical priesthood that is uh, understood by Christians. It's no longer the temple worship of old that governs uh, Christian worship. It's rather the ministry of Jesus Christ, our great high priest, uh, our prophet, priest, and king, as the reformers will insist. So it's that priesthood that he is referring to. So we have on the one hand, Aaron, on the other hand, Christ. He also uh, is reflecting on uh, his two natures, one, which is in the first Adam, and the second, who's in the second Adam. And once again, he's making reference to, to Jesus Christ, the firstborn from the dead, um, and the supreme uh, uh, in all things. And certainly, again, the great high priest, he's going to see himself there. And then finally, he's going to see himself personally implicated in this, <clears throat> because the gospel of Jesus Christ, which pronounces grace and mercy, does so to those who are sinners. And he needs to acknowledge that he is not, by virtue of wearing vestments, clothed in manners that will be a will uh, receive God's pardon and his mercy. It's not the vestments, the outer vestments, but rather the vestments of righteousness, 
we're told repeatedly to put on righteousness, put on Christ's righteousness. <clears throat> Remember back in the Garden of Eden, when Adam and Eve uh, are in the garden, they are originally naked and unashamed, it says Genesis 2.28. Uh, and when, they, when the serpent comes and tempts them and brings them to fall, we're told that they are they cover themselves up uh, when God comes in their presence and because they're ashamed. God asks Adam why he's hiding where he is and why he is covered. And he asks him the very telling question, um, who told you that you were naked? And the question here, they knew they were naked. He knew they were naked before, but they have become aware of themselves in a sense. And with that sense of their nakedness, their sense of guilt and their unrighteousness. And so they seek to clothe themselves and God out of mercy clothes them with a different sort of clothing, the clothing from uh, an animal, which is sacrificed, which becomes a type of the sacrifice of <clears throat> clothing that God will give them. And it's the clothing of Christ's righteousness. So they have no, their robes are dirty, filthy. His robes are pure, white, whatever. These are the robes of righteousness that is put on. So all of these scriptures are brought to bear in this reflection, uh, uh, Herbert's reflection here in Aaron. But note it begins with holiness on the head. Now, if you go to the footnote here, Exodus 28, 36 to 37, thou shalt make a, a plate of pure gold engrave upon it like the engravings of a signet, holiness to the Lord. So holiness is on the head. And remember, Christ is the head of the church as well. And so the garments uh, that Aaron wears are full of signification themselves. The head is holy, and the head directs the body. There are light and perfections on the breast. Once again, the footnote, Exodus 28, 30, and thou shalt put in the breastplate of judgment the Urim and Thummim, and they shall be upon Aaron's heart when he goeth in before the Lord, and Aaron shall bear the judgment of the children of Israel upon his heart before the Lord continually. He does so to bring them, <clears throat> that is the, the whole 12 tribes represented on this Urim and Thummim, and is uh, interceding on their behalf as the high priest would do. But of course, now we have a great high priest who is Christ, Again, so again, there are two priesthoods in mind here. There are two Aaron's, there are two um, men, the old Adam, the new Adam, all this polarity uh, of uh, and dualisms of sorts are being uh, presented here. So holiness on the head, light and perfections on the breast, harmonious bell. So this is directly referring to the, to the regalia of Aaron, the first one, to lead them unto life and rest. Thus are true Aaron's dressed. Okay. But how about his, the personal application? Well, as Herbert, George Herbert, Anglican priest, profaneness in my head, as opposed to holiness, defects and darkness in my breast, as opposed to light and perfections, a noise of passions, ringing me for dead, not harmonious below, raising the dead unto a place where there is no rest to lead them unto life and rest. So there's a, a, an explicit contrast it's, there's no parallelism at all other than that of antithesis. And so he's a poor priest in and of himself. That is what he is now. So he's confessing that as a priest, he is nonetheless a sinner. And this is important. He's, he's acknowledging he, something essential. He has not been uh, had by the laying on of hands. He, has not been in, have, he does not have an imparted righteousness to him. There isn't a greater sanctity to George Herbert, the priest, uh, just by virtue of the fact that he's had hands laid on him and has there been given a different order of sanctity. He's denying that. Let me go to the third uh, stanza. Here's his consolation. Although it is true of himself that he's profane with defects and he is doomed to death, he has another head another heart and breast, another music making live not dead without whom he would have no rest. In him, I am well-dressed. In Christ, Paul's, the Apostle Paul's favorite phrase for those who are believers is to be in Christ. 
and we're clothed in him. It's almost, and he says that we should put on Christ. It's, it's as if we, uh, Christ is here and we are behind it. We can't actually see the man, um, the, the sinner that George Herbert is, because when we look, when God the Father looks at George Herbert, he sees God the Son in whom he is well pleased. He is dressed in him. He is clothed in everything righteous of him that is credited to Mr. Herbert by imputation, imputed righteousness, once again. And so he says with confidence in the fourth stanza, Christ is my only head, my only head. Note that his own head is no longer uh, that of George Herbert is not the one that God sees. It's Christ alone that he sees. My alone only heart and breast, my only music. There's no dissonance. There's no discord. There's no uh, note that rings against this within him because God the Father is pleased with his son, striking me even dead. And that to the old man I may rest and be in him new dressed. So here we have, again, the significance of the substitutionary atonement and the imputation of, of Christ's righteousness forensically. It means that the old man, God the Father, no longer sees him. So he's not talking so much here, I think, about church vestments. He's talking about doctrine, and he's talking about the, as I say, the imputed righteousness of Christ for all who are his priests. Now, who are those who are his priests? Well, Herbert will say at one with the reformers that the uh, all of God's people are priests, a holy nation, a royal priesthood uh, that God has created. And so he's going to collapse this clergy laity distinction to some degree in his understanding uh, of, um, of being a believer. And so that we can all uh, worship God directly uh, through the uh, great high priest, Jesus Christ. Anyway, I can answer further questions when we meet together. Let me move on to his poem, Windows. Now, windows are an obvious thing in churches. Uh, in the Reformation, they are, again, subject to controversy um, insofar as some of them depict uh, things that would be regarded as uh, contrary to God's word because they have graven images and uh, there's a belief again amongst the puritans that we should seek to avoid that herbert is tangentially or at least apparently pointing to that controversy but once again as in aaron he's not actually talking about that he's talking about windows in a personal sense and an individual sense something that every believer can uh, aspire to and understand. Although here in particular, he's talking about, again, the minister and his function or his vocation as a preacher of the word. Let me read it first of all. Lord, who can, how can man preach thy eternal word? He is a brittle, crazy glass. Yet in thy temple thou dost him afford this glorious and transcendent place to be a window through thy grace. But when thou dost anneal in glass thy story, making thy life to shine within the holy preachers, then the light and glory more reverend grows and more doth win, which else shows waterish, bleak, and thin. Doctrine and life, colors and light, in one when they combine and mingle, bring a strong regard and awe. But speech alone doth vanish like a flaring thing, and in the ear, not conscience, ring. What he's discussing here throughout, and it seems to me this is really quite interesting, <clears throat> is the way in which God's, the human words of the preacher can so unfold the written word that it leads to the living word, or rather how the Holy Spirit uh, can use the preacher's words to reveal God to people so that when people hear the preacher, they hear Christ speaking to them through the medium of the preacher who is here compared to a window, a window through whom we can see light. Now, note here, he's talking about uh, what 
is not called a sacrament, but he has a sacramental understanding of the word. And this seems entirely appropriate if you consider that God himself is called the word, the word of God. Uh, in the church, uh, Catholic Church, there are seven sacraments. Uh, amongst the Reformers, there are two, baptism and communion. But it would be probably accurate to say uh, the strongest emphasis, although it's never called a sacrament, is on the sacrament of the word and the emphasis on preaching, the way in which God himself addresses the congregation through that preaching. And it is considered to be something akin to what uh, Herbert is calling windows, but really is not talking about windows. He's talking about uh, sacred speech. Note at the outset, Lord, how can man preach thy eternal word? Well, it's like a window. Now, there's a great deal of discussion in contemporary uh, churches and in Christian circles and now in secular circles as well about the problem of interpretation and hermeneutics. How, do, how are we to understand uh, communication to happen? We spend a great deal of time on that in my lit theory class, which some of you are in. Uh, but here, he is talking specifically about the preaching of the word of God and how that works exactly. Is it just communication? Is it the, tr the preacher giving his point of view? Is it uh, limited by space and time, by, by history, by the limitations of the preacher? Well, Herbert would probably acknowledge all of those things from what we said in discussing uh, Aaron, he's acknowledging that he himself uh, has nothing good in him. On the other hand, he's saying uh, here that it he does preach thy eternal word. There's an element of mystery here. Nonetheless, he declares quite uh, clearly that he thinks that that is what is happening, despite his nature. And what is his nature? Well, he says it right here. Man is a brittle, crazy glass. And yet, and yet, in thy temple, thou dost him afford this glorious and transcendent place to be a window through thy grace. So it's not that there's no uh, medium. There is a medium. The medium is the person that's doing the preaching. Nonetheless, it is as if God is speaking. So when Jesus calls the disciples, he says, whoever hears you, hears me. Note that that's a very strong statement that Jesus himself says to the disciples. He doesn't say, whenever they hear you, it's as if they were hearing me. He says, whoever hears you, hears me. There's a direct, there's an ownership there and, uh, and a conflation to some degree of the word of God with the words of the preacher. That's the understanding that I believe that Herbert is articulating here. But when thou dost anneal in glass thy story, so to use through heat, putting uh, pictures into church windows, now obviously going to offend the extreme Puritans that are not going to even have the stories of scripture in uh, the uh, church windows. Um, referring to that process, there, it's not pure clarity. It's not just a blank or a, a transparent window. There's a story that is imparted there. There's a form in, that is being there. And what's the particular form? Well, now he's not wading into the controversy about church windows. He's talking about the story that's annealed or hardened through heat in the preacher himself. What is that? Thy life to shine within the holy preachers. It's the fact that they live and follow Jesus Christ and in their daily walks, that story, which is, which they believe is born about in the way they conduct themselves and in the way they speak. When they, your life, that is the life of Christ shines out from the preachers, then the light and glory more reverend go, grows, more worshipful, and more doth win. So when the preacher is more Christ-like, more of a servant, more of a, um, less the man you see in front, in front of him and more one that points to God who's doing the winning of souls, then it is superior, which otherwise shows waterish, bleak, and thin. So he's not talking about the potency of rhetoric. Rather, he's talking about the potency of the word, 
which comes most winningly when it's coupled with the humility of the preacher. And at that point in the third standard, doctrine and life, colors and light in one, when they combine and min mingle. Watch your doctrine, watch your life, says the Apostle Paul. Herbert echoes it here. So it's one in word and action. When they combine and mingle, bring a strong regard and awe. But speech alone doth vanish like a flaring thing and in the ear, not conscience ring. So what he is saying here is that it's insufficient to have doctrinal rectitude. It must be coupled with character and conduct. And so the preacher has to be Christ-like in his deportment and not just in his doctrine. Very important emphasis that Mr. Herbert makes here. Let's come to the final poem, Redemption. Now, this is a little parable of sorts. It sounds very much like one of Jesus' parables, but it's not. And it's reflecting on doctrinal truth. Uh, let me just read it first of all, and then I'll comment. It's called Redemption. Having been tenant long to a rich Lord, not thriving, I resolved to be bold and make a suit unto him to afford a new small rented lease and cancel the old. In heaven at his manor, I him sought. They told me there that he was lately gone about some land which he had dearly bought long since on earth to take possession. I straight returned and knowing his great birth, sought him accordingly in great resorts in cities, theaters, gardens, parks, and courts. At length, I heard a ragged noise and mirth of thieves and murderers. There I him espied, who straight, your suit is granted, said, and died. So this little parable is once again um, subtle and, and, and slightly far more complex than it appears on the surface. He's talking about redemption. He's once again talking about doctrine. And he's once again talking about the significance of Substit substitutionary atonement, the uh, death of the Lord that gives us our life. Note that he begins here with, to some degree, what he does in, in other elsewhere, um, in talking about the whole of the human, uh, the state of human nature. Remember, he did this in the altar, or more um, significantly in Easter wings. He starts with the whole of the human race before he moves on then to talk about about his state as an individual and also as a christian and how different the two are so he talks about the state of humanity the plight of humanity before then moving on to um, the state as it is after the advent of christ and that is also the case here in this poem. Once I'll go, I'll go back to the uh, putting the poem up on the screen here. So he starts with the notion of, of covenants. There's an old covenant, an old uh, a tenancy agreement he had. That's how he begins it. So the, the opening gambit in the first stanza of these four lines, Lord, bold, afford, old. Yeah, you can see once again, the sort of strong uh, repetition here. Um, he says that he uh, and imagines himself here as someone living under the old covenant, understanding God in terms of his distance, his superiority, his greatness. And of course, appropriately, he will seek him in heaven, not on earth, but up to heaven. And so he goes there and he seeks him out. Where would he seek out God? Well, of course, in the high places in heaven at his manor, I him sought. And they told me there that he was lately gone about some land. This is a very, uh, <clears throat> this is understatement. He's gone about some land. Well, he's gone to redeem the heavens and the earth. But he's gone about some land which he had dearly bought long since on earth to take possession. He's talking about the incarnation here. So he goes up to heaven to find God to start a new uh, tenancy agreement because he's not happy with the old one and he finds out that God is also unhappy with the old terms and it has also 
going has gone to himself in person in the person of his son his incarnate son to do something with that tenancy agreement agreement so herbert having heard that god had done this he goes and seeks him on earth where does he seek them well he seeks them in the high places he seeks them in great resorts and cities theaters gardens parks and courts all of the places where you would expect the son of God uh, to be in the higher echelons of human life, just as he would be in heaven. Being God, that's what one would anticipate. Instead, he finds them uh, in the rabble behind him, hearing a ragged noise and mirth of thieves and murderers. He sees him there. And then he comes with these telling words who straight, your suit is granted said and died now the last word is the most important one in the whole poem the suit being granted is in reference back to the very first uh, stanza he wants a new suit he wants a new relationship he wants new terms and that is granted he says straight away you can have that new tenancy agreement. But having said that, he then dies. And this is the key point in the entire uh, poem. Because at that point, the theology of Herbert is going to shine through. Remember that uh, Jesus says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. And whoever has my commandments and keep them, it is he it is who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my father. That's John 14 and 15. And verse 21 for that matter. And he says, if you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I've kept my father's commandment and abide in his love. So it's not a question of moving from the law to the gospel. Um, it is a question of um, fulfilling and abiding in God's commandments that uh, is in sight here. And that commandment and that relationship is uh, sealed in the death of the Lord, not just in the incarnation, but in his death. And that's the, uh, the strong conclusion to this great poem, is that uh, in his blood, in his death, he has come and shed the blood of the new covenant. We can see that in Matthew 26, 28, where it says, this is the blood of my covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins, or in Hebrews 10, 29, um, how much worse do you think uh, will be deserved by the one who has trampled underfoot the Son of God and has profaned the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified? And so he's the mediator of a new covenant, but the covenant is sealed in his blood. So the death here uh, is the very thing that seals the new covenant. Now, what's the new covenant? Well, the new covenant is uh, just like the old covenant. It is in uh, the words of Jesus, the greatest commandment to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself. These are the terms of the new covenant. Jesus displays that by dying. So there is a, uh, a parallelism between the old tenancy agreement and the new, but note that it is sealed by God's word of pardon and also his death. These things are what makes Herbert called this redemption. I'll leave you with that and see you next time.